Well, we'll just begin with a, a short prayer. We'll just make the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a moment in quiet. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This talk is called Melanie and the Secret of La Salette and it'll take a little over an hour. Uh, so if you need to leave, that's no problem. Uh, I'm going to talk, first of all, about the, one of the visionaries, especially Melanie. That's the first part of the talk, the controversies around her. And secondly, the secret of La Salette, which is also controversial. So to introduce this, the apparition of La Salette has always been very close to our community. Father John Mary lived just a few miles from where the Blessed Mother appeared when he was a young monk living with a group of hermits near there. And for many other reasons, it's very important to us. The apparition of La Salette has been officially approved by the Vatican, not just by tradition, not just by the local bishop. It's been officially approved by the Vatican. There are under 20 apparitions that uh, have that stature, and La Salette is one of them. It has its feast on the Universal Church calendar, so we can have a lot of confidence in this apparition. The church couldn't approve it any more than it has. However, the visionaries are very controversial, uh, especially Melanie. And that stems largely from the fact that she received a secret, which she published. And the secret was very apocalyptic, very uh, politically charged in a sense. And most importantly, it was very critical of corruption in the clergy, especially in France. And so when it was published, she was vilified. Even before it was published, she was vilified. The two children are not canonized, as they're not like St. Juan Diego or Blessed Francisco and Jacinta Marta from Fatima. And you can find a lot of criticism of these children. I want to read you one passage. This is from a Catholic PhD author. He wrote it in the 90s. Uh, it was found by a sister named Sister Anne Farin, who's trying to found a religious community based on the rule given to Melanie by the Blessed Mother. And he's just reiterating the kind of mainstream uh, take on La Salette. And I think it's helpful to, to see that. Maximin, that is the boy, never really reformed. Even after the apparition, he kept up his career as the village rascal. Maximin was given the chance to prepare for the priesthood, but he had no vocation for it. He could never concentrate on his studies and never found a career that he could perform. Evidently, he took to drink, just as his father had done. Melanie's story is even less edifying. She went to school at the nearby village of Korank and later with the Sisters of Providence in Cor. She went eventually to Darlington, England, about as far away from La Salette as she could get, and became a Carmelite postulant. But she didn't make the grade. She transferred to another convent in Marseille, France, but she had no more vocation to the religious life than Maximin did. Well, she seems to have thought that she did, but nobody else agreed with her. She never came to terms with the self-effacement and obscurity that are integral parts of religious life, and she never embraced obedience. She wandered up and down Europe, attracting a lot of attention that she felt she deserved. She poured out a continuous torrent of abuse against any prelate, that is bishop, who didn't treat her like a celebrity. She settled at Castellamare near Naples, and in 1879 she published her secret, or what she said was her secret, in a book of her own that somehow got the imprimatur from the local bishop, but was condemned by Rome. It also consisted largely of personal vituperations against clerics. It's not uncommon that a person called to a great mission falls profoundly from that mission. We have the example of King David, Judas Iscariot, and so many popes in church history. So it's possible that this is all true. However, what Jesus Christ says about the, or 
it's not uncommon that a person called to a prophetic mission experiences uh, a lot of calumny against them unjustly, which would be on the other hand. As Jesus himself said, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. Uh, And so we have the example of St. Joan of Arc. St. Joan of Arc, the initial judgment of the pastors of the church was that she was a heretic and a witch, and they burned her at the stake. And it took 500 years for the church to officially recognize her as a saint. So there's been much written to refute these criticisms, which I just read to you. And over the years, I'm very interested in Lost Letter. Over the years, I've read them on the internet or in books. And they seemed, the refutations of these criticisms seemed logical and uh, true to me. But they were never sufficiently cited or sourced where I felt I could get up here and speak publicly on the apparition. That changed when I discovered uh, this book. It's called Discovering the Secret of La Salette. And unfortunately, it's only written, it's not translated into English. It's only in French. I have a very minimal knowledge of French, but I worked my way through it. And what it is, is this priest, Father Michel Courtville, was doing a doctoral thesis on La Salette, on the children in the secret. And when, in the course of researching, he discovered the original text of the secret of La Salette, which had been lost to history. And I'll speak more about that later. He did, uh, it was a meticulously researched, well-cited doctoral thesis, which was essentially a vindication of the children, of the holiness of the children, and the secret of La Salette. And this thesis he defended before the Angelicum, which is the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. It's one of the Vatican's official universities. And they approved it and awarded him a doctorate for this study. And so this study is something we can have great confidence in. It doesn't mean everything is true in it, but the the Angelicum is arguably the greatest arbiter, the greatest judge of scholarship in the Catholic Church, and they found this worthy of a doctorate of theology. So what I'm going to do is essentially just share with you, I say, the story of Melanie and then the the story of the secret, some aspects of the secret, uh, basing it mainly on this book, um, It's a very complex story, so I have to simplify a lot. And lastly, I'm not going to read the secret. Uh, The secret was once forbid, the church did at one point forbid that it be published. However, that ban has been lifted with the reforms of Vatican II, and it's now completely fine. Uh, The book, it it publishes, it has all versions of the secret in it. It has the imprimatur and Nikhil Obstat from different bishops. That's fine to discuss. So... To La Salette could be considered a response to the French Revolution, so I think I just want to speak briefly on that. La Salette is 1846, and the French Revolution was 1789. And many Catholic historians and theologians consider the French Revolution to be a satanic event. It was extremely anti-Catholic, and just one expression of that is it ended up, there was a point where any priest or bishop who wouldn't renounce their faith and swear an oath of allegiance to the atheistic government would have their head cut off. And so 30,000 priests fled France, um, one estimation holds. And the Pope eventually formally openly condemned the French Revolution. And that led Napoleon Bonaparte, who was in charge of the army, to invade Rome, take the Pope prisoner, and he would die in exile as Napoleon's prisoner, Pope Pius VI. Immediately after that, they elected the new pope, Pius VII, and under immense pressure from Napoleon, who all but killed his predecessor, he gives Napoleon immense administrative power over the church in France in what's called the Concordat of 1801. It's a very lamentable decision, but he was under immense pressure. And with the Concordat, Napoleon, who... uh, I think Napoleon... I've heard theologians refer to Napoleon as an antichrist, Not the Antichrist who is to come, but in the same way the scriptures refer to Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greek ruler at the time of the Maccabees, as an Antichrist, and Nero as an Antichrist, or as Hitler as an Antichrist, a prefiguring, a type of the Antichrist who is to come. Napoleon the Freemason, the atheist, the man who wanted to infiltrate 
and remake the church in his own image. With the church's blessing, he can now, uh, he, he owns all church property, all church buildings. He pays the salaries of any priest or bishop, so they're in his pocket. He can put heads of seminaries in place, heads of parishes, and above all, he can name whoever he wants bishop. And with the church's blessing, he forcibly resigns around 100 bishops. Most of them are those who are opposed to him, the good bishops who refused to kiss his shoe. And then when he chooses men who are clearly unfit, clearly his plants, clearly, I would assume, atheists and not truly Christians to become bishop in France, and the Pope is outraged by this, all the Pope can say is, we'll have them renounce their allegiance to you, their oath to you, and swear an oath of allegiance to the church. They did, but I don't think that oath meant much. I think through Napoleon, a lot of corruption entered into the French church, especially the episcopate, the bishops, and that uh, has had devastating effects on France, as Lucy knows very well, till today, but it will have devastating effects on La Salette. <laughs> this is a coin Napoleon had struck when he... Uh, when he convened the Sanhedrin for the first time since the fall of Jerusalem, and it's an image of himself as Yahweh giving the law to Moses, which corresponds very well to what St. Paul describes the Antichrist at. Uh, so the visionaries. They were born in the 1830s in southwestern France near Grenoble in the small mountain town called Cor. The boy, Maximin, they both had very... You're welcome to come in. Howdy. Welcome. <laughs> the, uh, the boy, they both had very dark childhoods. The boy had an abusive stepfather, pardon me, an abusive father and uh, alcoholic father, abusive stepmother, no religious formation, very poor, no education. After the apparition of the Blessed Mother, he said he'd heard there was a Blessed Virgin, but he didn't know who she was. He didn't know that she was the mother of God. Um, for all that, he was very extroverted, very likable, very outgoing. This is a little psychological profile written by Sister Anne Farin, who I mentioned earlier. Maximin would bear the signs of his harsh childhood. Psychologically, he was unstable. He found it difficult to concentrate. He was forever fidgeting, twirling his hat, or racing around. The nuns call him perpetual motion. His fragile health due to long years of malnutrition led to his early death. Melanie, her childhood was far darker. Her father tried to shoot and kill her when she was a teenager, and he was the better of the two parents. Her mother was profoundly psychologically and emotionally abusive towards Melanie. And when her father, who was a stonemason, was out for weeks or even months on jobs, she would set kick Melanie out of the house to live out in the wilderness on her own on the mountainside uh, for, for weeks, even for months at a time. She would also hire her out from a very young age to, to serve different people, sometimes for full seasons. One point, they were, uh, these people were very unsavory. They tried to molest, beat, and rape Melanie. She's miraculously saved from that. But it's a, it's a rough time. The saving grace in all of this is that when she was out, the very first day when she was kicked out of the house, a little boy came up to her as she was crying out in the woods, and he began, he called himself her little brother, or her brother, and he would speak to her about God and play with her and pray with her. And when she was 10 years old, th he, this boy would come every day. And when he was, she was 10, this boy conferred upon her the stigmata, making her the youngest stigmatist on record. And thanks to Father Courtville, we have written testimony from priests, religious, uh, religious superiors, spiritual directors, and even canonized saints about Melanie's stigmata from every point in her life, remained with her her entire life. Um, so that's a, a great sign in her favor. She had all the marks, and they would appear on Fridays during Lent and surrounding the Feast of La Salette, as is often the case with stigmatists. Uh, this is again from Sister Anne Farron, just a psycholo psychological profile of her. Melanie had almost no opportunity for social interactions with children her age. She did not know how to play, 
She is profoundly psychologically ab abused, and she will be socially inhibited the rest of her life, always apologizing for herself. Jesus does not heal her of these wounds, which actually works very well for dealing with the abuse from clergy that she'll suffer the rest of her life on account of the secret. As she grows older and gains some education from the nuns, she becomes intellectually astute, but her natural demeanor is always to abase herself, to feel worthy of abuse, not to be expected to be treated well. Abuse doesn't shake her or take her by surprise. It doesn't send her into depression or into fits of rage. Emotional illness, and there is no question that Melanie was neurotic, had no more effect on her spiritual and intellectual development than a physical illness like asthma or diabetes. Sick persons can carry their cross with virtue or with vice. I think that's a really helpful point, uh, especially in our day and age when so many people have so many emotional wounds, that to, to understand them as we would a physical ailment in something that can be offered, even though it, it does hinder us, that can be offered to the Lord. And Sister Anne feels they should be patrons of abused children, and I think that's, uh, I agree. The apparition took place in 1846 on September 19th. The, the children, Maximin and Melanie, met the day before. They'd never known each other. They'd both been hired out to a local landowner to pasture sheep, pasture cows for him. And their personalities were so different, introvert and extrovert, they didn't get along well, but they, they were friends enough. The next day... They're still pasturing these cows, and they wake up after a midday nap, and they see a great light uh, down below them. The, that building, that's the site, uh, the shrine built at the site of the apparition, that beautiful area. They see a great light. They're afraid. They go down to investigate. Maximin gets his stick ready to strike the Blessed Mother and his dog ready to bite her. He doesn't know who she is. And they come upon this woman who they say the most beautiful woman they'd ever seen. And she's seated, weeping. Uh, and she says to them, Come near, my children, fear not. I am here to tell you great news. And it's not going to sound like great news, but... Uh, and just one little parenthesis. One curious thing about how she appeared, I don't know if you can see. I'm going to turn the lights down just so it's more visible. Uh, she was... She had a band of roses, a chain of roses across her chest, and also an iron chain across her chest. And this is very curious, I don't know why, but some people, uh, some modern mystics have wondered or put forward that in the book of Revelation it says that the devil, Satan, will be chained for a thousand years with the great chain. And some mystics have put forward that that refers to the rosary, this great chain with which Satan will be bound. And they wonder if this chain of roses and iron is an allusion to that part of Revelations. Um, but so this is the, the public message. She says, If my people will not obey, I shall be compelled to loose my son's arm. It is so heavy, so pressing that I can no longer restrain it. Now see, with La Salette, it's not, a, it's not like a sweet message like Lourdes or Guadalupe. <coughs> It is a message of correction and repentance, which is probably another reason why it's lesser known, because it's not a fun message. How long I have suffered for you. If my son is not to cast you off, I am obliged to entreat him without ceasing. But you take no least notice of that. No matter how well you pray in future, no matter how well you act, you will never be able to make up to me what I have endured for your sake. And she speaks to them especially about keeping holy the Sabbath and taking the Lord's name in vain. And she threatens a famine that will come if people don't uh, correct that. Midway through speaking, she says, Oh, my dear children, you don't understand me. Because she's speaking in French, and they speak a, a dialect of French and Italian. And so she repeats everything in their dialect to them. And it's funny because she obviously knows what language they speak. Uh, one explanation is that this isn't a message for the children. She's not trying to beat up on these two children. It's a message for fallen away France in general. That's why it's in French. After concluding the message, she gives a secret to each of the children, like at Fatima. She gives a rule to religious life for Melanie. And then she gives another secret, 
which no one has ever heard. It's never been revealed to Melanie. She tells and she says, go tell the people about this message. They do. Pilgrims start flooding in. A miraculous spring appears where the Blessed Mother appeared. There's healings from the spring. Uh, Pilgrims start coming in from all over France and all over Europe. This is before Fatima, before Lourdes. It's kind of one of the first international Marian apparition pilgrimages. And it causes a great political stir. Uh, After Napoleon Bonaparte fell, there was a restoration of the Catholic monarchy. And then that was later overtaken by Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III, who has a coup and takes over the government. And this Catholic uprising, so to speak, or this Catholic swelling in La Salette is very troubling for Napoleon. So it's a kind of a, a hotbed. The bishop in, La, in Grenoble, in La Salette, is Bishop Philibert de Bruyard, a very holy bishop. Uh, he wasn't elected during the Napoleonic times. That he, was, he was made bishop during the restoration of the monarchy when some good guys got in. And as a young priest, he was very holy. He didn't flee France. He lived in hiding, ministering to those who were being executed. And it's his job to discern the secret of La Salette. When he realizes the situation Melanie and Maximin are in at home, he, he puts them in a convent where they can live and learn to read and write. This is Melanie's account from that time. She said, Although I noticed many good qualities in Maximin, I shunned him as much as I could because he was opposed to my nature as a savage. She's referring to herself as a savage, this kind of wild girl who grew up on the mountainside and is kind of very uncouth. Uh, and say she's very introverted and Maximin's very extroverted. During the four years that we stayed in the same boarding school, I always tried not to meet him. We seldom remained a quarter of an hour together without getting upset. Um, Just one story from this time. Maximin is at one point taken by some some royalist men who probably had very human uh, political ideas, maybe overly human political ideas, to the curé of ours because they wanted to know about the secret. And Maximin was going to go to confession about the, with the curé of ours, St. John Mary Vianney. And uh, when they arrived, they were met by the curé of ours associate pastor, Father Raymond, who's well known for being uh, kind of indiscreet and a pretty difficult character. And he kind of verbally abused Maximin and said that he didn't believe in the secret. He thought Maximin had made it up. This is before the approval. And Maximin said, well, if that's what you think, put it down that I made it all up. If that's what you want to believe. And so Father Raymond goes and tells the curé, Maximin confessed to me that he, he made up about this apparition. And the curé is very troubled by this. And in confession, he asks, asks Maximin, did you lie to the priest? Or did, did you lie about the apparition? And at this point, the curé has lost most of his teeth. And he's speaking French and he's hard to understand. And Maximin still doesn't speak French very well. And so he says, yes, I lied. He's thinking he's asking about back home. He said, yeah, I lied about kind of going to mass or to catechism. And so the curé thinks that Maximin has made this all up. And from that point, the curé of ours stops autographing uh, images of La Salette. And people take notice of that. And that's just one example of the confusion and, and suffering that surrounds La Salette. The curé did receive miraculous signs from the Blessed Mother that, uh, through which he regained his faith in the apparition. But that's just one anecdote. So he discerns the apparition for five years, the bishop, and he does it in close consultation with Pope Pius IX, Blessed Pius IX, very holy pope. And before the approval, Pius wants to see the secret. And this is very troubling for Melanie because she was told explicitly not to reveal it until 1858. But she accedes to the request as long as it's only viewed by the bishop and by the pope. And so it is sent to Pius IX and he reads it and he's deeply troubled or visibly troubled. They come back later and he says to them, referring to the secret, These are the scourges with which France is threatened. She is not the only guilty one. Germany, Italy, all Europe is and merits these punishments. I fear less the anarchist than religious indifference and human respect. I think he means by that that he feels lukewarm Catholics are ultimately more harmful for the church than radically anti-Christian persons. 
I had your book examined by Bishop Frattini, promoter of the faith. He told me that it was good, that it breathed the truth. And with that, the apparition is approved. Um, unfortunately, after the approval, Bishop Philibert de Bruyard retires. It's understandable he's 86, and the man who replaces him is this man, Bishop Achille Genouliac. As I said earlier, the, uh, the French government had just been taken over by Napoleon III, and there's many, I think, pl Napoleonic plants in place, and La Salette is this hotbed where Melanie has been heard to be speaking negatively about Napoleon III as a great blasphemer, and they feel it might be a place of royalist uprising. And so it seems that Achille Genouliac was put in place by the, the powers of the French bishops and maybe Napoleon III to really crush uh, La Salette, and crush the visionaries, which it's inarguable that he did. He says to all his priests that they have, Melanie has lost her mind, and he threatens, later will threaten them with excommunication if they ever return to La Salette. So, and after he does all this, after he destroys their reputation, he's then made Archbishop of Lyon, the second largest city in France and its primatial see, which seems pretty clear to be a promotion for a, a job well done. His first, his first thing he does as bishop, one of the first things is he calls Melanie and Maximin in and has them write his secrets, their secrets for him. And after reading them, he kicks Maximin out of the seminary. And Melanie, he exiles, sends as a prisoner to Austria. Uh, Melanie at this time has been in the convent for three years as a sister. She's just been unanimously elected by all the sisters to make vows. Very well received. The sisters speak of her holiness, of her stigmata, and the fact that at, at night she suffers intense demonic attack, being beaten by demons throughout the night, as Padre Pio was. So they were, they were very pleased with her. her. Her spiritual director actually later said, if St. Therese had to undergo the trials over which Melanie triumph, triumphed, she would have succumbed. It's a very strong statement. But, but he sends Melanie off to Austria, where she doesn't speak the language, to be essentially a prisoner in a convent there. And when Melanie realizes this and told she can't leave, she throws messages out the window calling for the police. She's freed, and she, she makes her way back to her convent. When she gets back, he sends her way again, this time to England, to Darlington, England. Uh, he tells her it'll just be for a short time. It will be six years. She doesn't realize that at first, but she gets there, and she just resigns herself. She takes the habit. She makes vows. Um, she's well-received, even though she doesn't speak the language. The Superior writes letters regarding miraculous healings through her stigmata of a priest. And things go well until 1858, the year in which she's supposed to reveal the secret. And she sends a copy of it to Blessed Pius IX. It's just a nicer picture to look at. Pius IX. And when she asks her superiors if she could publish the secret, they refuse her permission. And she feels this is something God is truly asking her to do, so she asks to, to leave the convent to do so. And they refuse to let her go. I, don't, I assume this isn't the will of the superior of the convent. It seemed like they were good sisters, but these were rules coming down from above. Melanie again throws notes over the convent wall, and she's freed. And she makes her way to, to southern France. She'll spend about seven years in a convent in Marseille but she'll later settle in southern Italy uh, under the patronage of the bishops there. Blessed Pius IX concurs with this. He feels it's better for her to re remain outside the convent and to try to found the religious order. And she'll spend about the next 10 years trying to do that. And like St. Faustina, who was also called to found a religious community that never materialized, it is the same with Melanie. It kind of never, never comes about. For what reason exactly, I don't know. The French bishops were certainly opposed to it, but that's the case. This is what Melanie looked like around that time. Uh, in 1878, a new pope comes to the throne, Leo XIII, who, you know, who composed the St. Michael prayer, and tradition holds he had this vision of Rome being surrounded by demonic forces uh, trying to get in. 
which is very similar to the secret of La Salette. He calls Melanie to Rome, and she spends five months meeting with him there. He wants her to found her community, but the French bishops make it impossible. He wants it in France, but it's just not going to happen. It's after this, it's after meeting with Leo for five months that she publishes her secret. I don't, we don't have record of them speaking of that, but it would make sense that that happened. She publishes her secret with the imprimatur from her bishop, and it causes a huge stir. I say it's very apocalyptic, it's very critical, the French clergy, and they clamor that Rome censure this secret, which, which they do. They, they forbid printing of it while they discuss it. The Holy Office, which is what we now call the Congregation uh, for the Doctrine of the Faith, the Holy Office reviews the secret, and they call different theologians together. One is the head of the Polish seminary, Father Semenko, who says, I hold the substance of the message to be true. He believes the message is true. And he identifies that strong, even exaggerated language is typical of prophetic messages. The Congregation of the Index, the Index of Forbidden Books, they say it is a question of fact that is not doctrine. It's not a doctrinal question. The doctrine is fine in this message. It's a question of fact as to whether or not the clergy and religious orders are so corrupted. But the Vatican examiners remain at loggerheads regarding the secret, and the ban is left in place and even reiterated. And people say Melanie has lost her mind. She's become deluded or proud or arrogant. She's, um, she's added a bunch of things just based on personal anger and vituperations, as the guy said in the beginning. The striking thing is it's at this time where she's deeply inspiring men and women who the church has now canonized or beatified. While this is going on, she's staying with blessed Giacomo Cusmano, canonized, beatified by John Paul II, who's deeply inspired by her and uh, uses her rule for his own community. From there, she's called by a saint, now saint, canonized by John Paul II, Hannibal de Francia, uh, a great saint who has founded a convent, and the convent has fallen on hard times, and he wants Melanie to come to heal the convent. She goes, and she does. A convent is rejuvenated, and the sister who's in charge of the convent, the, the foundress, she, who Melanie would be in competition with, she says Melanie was truly a saint of constant virtue and of hidden life. That si servant of God, Nazarena Mahone, another exemplar of Christian virtue. Uh, and they speak of her stigmata and, and all the like. Saint Hannibal, who's pictured there, he to me is a really great counterbalance to La Salette because the children of La Salette highlight to me what Saint Paul says that God chooses the weak to shame the strong, and he puts his treasures in earthen vessels. They're these humanly weak, kind of they have their foibles and faults, and their, their human life doesn't amount to much. They don't do anything great in their human life. It's kind of all somewhat of a, a failure, so to speak. But they have this profound spiritual gift, this mystical gift. And St. Hannibal is the opposite. He is a human a prodigy of human virtue. He's a theologian, a priest, a publisher, a journalist. He founds orphanages and religious communities. And he has this prodigious, fruitful life on the human level. And he is the one who finds uh, such inspiration in Melanie. He will preach her funeral oration. He will start her cause for canonization and he'll have her body buried in his, one of his convents. Melanie will die in 1904. Uh, the people of the small town in Italy, they speak of heavenly lights and heavenly music the night she died. And uh, in 1923, St. Hannibal says, Melanie worked a miracle of instantaneous cure of a very serious illness of a sister with her appearance in one of my institutes. This is when he's beginning her process of canonization. She, she miraculously appeared in his convent, according to his testimony, and healed a sister. So that's a very strong thing in her favor that these uh, beatified and canonized saints hold her in such high regard. Um, just to speak briefly on Maximin, Maximin is very, a very dear person. He, um, he has, in my opinion, the lesser role in regard to Melanie as someone like St. Mark or St. Luke has a lesser role than St. John. 
not to slight him at all. But um, that's not Maximin, but I'll get to that. Just briefly, Maximin, after being kicked out of the seminary, tried to study, uh, he tried to enter another seminary, but his seminary advisors essentially said that the, the theological or clerical climate in France with, in La Salette and his situation, it's not going to work for him to be a priest. And so he tries medicine for a while, but he eventually settles as a life of a soldier. He becomes one of the papal zouave or zouave troops, a French army who's defending the Pope. He'll later be drafted into the French army itself, but his health is very weak. He eventually gets out of the army and trying to support himself, he goes into business with a man who's distilling uh, spirits, liquor, and the man swindles him and cheats him and leaves him in poverty. Uh, a lot of people criticize him for that. They say, oh, this prophet is uh, selling liquor. And Father Michel Courtville, he makes the point that if we hold that opinion, we also need to consider so many of the monasteries throughout Europe, some of the very strict monasteries who support themselves by precisely distilling liquor and beer. Um, Maximin is say he's cheated by this guy, and he just kind of dies in poverty and kind of nothingness in La Salette. This is from... Uh, Sister Anne Farin, homeless and itinerant, he spoke everywhere of the apparition in his journeys in Italy, his stay in one or another part of France. He made known to many, he made known to as many people as he met what he had seen and heard at La Salette. He never got away from poverty and a humble station. Maximin said, Our Lady left me as I was. And there, may, there are miracles and prophetic events throughout his life, but this is just Maximin's final testimony before his death. He says, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I believe in all that the Holy Apostolic Roman Church teaches, in everything defined by our Holy Father, the Pope, the August and infallible Pius IX. I firmly believe, even were it to cost the shedding of my blood, in the renowned apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary on the holy mountain of La Salette. Excuse me. The apparition to which I have testified in words, in writings, and in suffering. After my death, let no one assert that he has heard me make any retraction concerning the great event of La Salette. For in lying to the world, he would be lying in his own breast. With these sentiments, I give my heart to Our Lady of La Salette. And Maximin is often compared to another French, French saint, Saint Benedict Joseph Labre, who was, uh, he's considered the patron saint of mental, people with mental illness. He tried to enter the seminary and different religious orders, but wasn't accepted, and eventually lived the life of just kind of an itinerant wanderer, uh, pilgrim, but in a life of great holiness. So now we'll move to the second part of this talk uh, about the secret of La Salette. Why does our Blessed Mother give secrets? I don't know, but it seems to me, reflecting on it a little bit, that it often it seems that she wants to give a message, sometimes a hard message, it's going to be hard for people to receive, controversial, difficult, and people are going to reject it. And so she first gives graces that are a lot easier for people to receive, miracles, uh, healings, easier message so that people can gain confidence in the visionary or the person she's chosen, and the church can maybe even approve it, and they can gain a track record, so that later on, with this, this trail of good fruit, she can then reveal a much harder message. To me, it's like when Jesus first feeds the 5,000 before then telling them they must eat his flesh and drink his blood. As he says, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. So the great question of La Salette is whether the secret Melanie published in 1878 is the same as the one she sent to Pius in 1851, or did she, as many say, make it up, add stuff? Was it embellished? Was it a personal message? That was answered somewhat in 1999, when the Vatican archives were opened for the first time uh, for the 1800s to scholars. And Michel Courtville found the original text of The Secret. I'll read that to you now. It's about a page long. 
Melanie, I will say something to you which you will not say to anybody. The time has a, of God's wrath has arrived. And I want to say they leave Melanie's um, kind of typographical and grammatical errors in here. If when you say to people what I have said to you so far, and what I will still ask you to say, if after that they do not convert, if they do not do penance, they do not cease working on Sunday, and if they continue to blaspheme the holy name of God, in a word, if the face of the earth does not change, God will be avenged against the people, ungrateful and slave of the demon. My son will make his power manifest. Paris, the city soiled by all kinds of crimes, will perish infallibly. Marseille will be destroyed in a little time. When these things arrive, the disorder will be complete on the earth. The world will be given up to its impious passions. The Pope will be persecuted from all sides. They will shoot at him. They will want to put him to death. But no one will, will not be able to do it. The vicar of God will triumph again this time. The priests and the sisters, the true servants of my son, will be persecuted. And several will die for the faith of Jesus Christ. A famine will reign at the same time. After all these will have arrived, many will recognize the hand of God on them. They will convert and do penance for their sins. A great king will go up the throne. He will reign a few years. Religion will reflourish and spread all over the world. And there will be great abundance. The world, glad not to be lacking nothing, will fall again in its disorders, will give up God, and will be prone to its criminal passions. Among God's ministers, the spouses of Jesus Christ, there will be some who will go astray, and that will be the most terrible. Lastly, hell will reign on earth. It will be then that the Antichrist will be born of a sister. But woe to her, many will believe in him, because he will claim to have come from heaven. Woe to those who will believe in him. That time is not far away. Twice fifty years will not go by. My child, you will not say what I have just said to you. You will not say it to anybody. You will not say if you must say it one day. You will not say what it concerns. Finally, you will say nothing anymore until I tell you to say it. Melanie says, I pray to the Holy Father to give me his blessing. So that was the secret that Melanie sent to the Pope in 1851. And it is definitely different from the secret she published in 1878. However, she and fathers Michelle Courtville and Renee Laurentin, I forgot to mention, this book is also co-authored by Renee Laurentin, who's a famous Mariologist, a priest, I, think, I believe he was a Pariti at Vatican II. He wrote the, the definitive popular book on Lourdes. What Father Courtville believes and what he defended before the Angelicum is that these two secrets are the same, although the one from 78 is five times longer and 20 times more intense. How is that so? Well, the, how is that so? <laughs> the first point is that the, the substance of the secrets are the same. That is, the secret of 51, which I just read, is like an outline of the secret she publishes in 78. The, the main structure, the main points are all the same. 78 is just far more clear, far more detailed, far more elaborate. The second point that's important to understand is that the secret was given to her as the secrets of Fatima, more in vision than in words. And so this picture, you can describe images, you can describe visions with greater or lesser detail. I could say, this is an image of a city under attack. And that would be a true description. Or I could say, it's an image of a city under attack and there's a great hero in the foreground and his head has fallen and there's a woman who's trying to escape a barbarian, and there are warships who've come in, and there's violence in the city, and there's fire in the background, and so on and so forth. And those would both be accurate descriptions, true descriptions of this picture. In 51, 
It wasn't the time to reveal the full secret, and Melanie was simply trying to make herself understood and to give the Pope a sense of what this was about. And she also said she didn't want to make him too sad. This is how Melanie herself described her experience receiving the secret. This is again, it's about a few paragraphs. She says, a large veil was lifted up. The events revealed themselves to my eyes, to my imagination, as she pronounced all the words, and a large space unfolded in front of me. I saw the events, and further on we see a thousand and a thousand times more things than what the ears hear. So she's saying she has this vast vision. The Lord says, Paris will burn, and that can mean, so she can see all sorts of details in the beginning and the reason for that and what that means spiritually and so on and so forth. I saw changes in the operation of the earth. And God, immutable in his glory, looked at the virgin, who lowered herself to speak to two shepherds, that is, the two children. One rises thus to a height which is not the sky. Perhaps one does not even change places. And the author interjects, was it in my body or without my body, says similarly St. Paul. But we see and hear everything. One understands without saying anything, and one forgets oneself entirely. The author again interjects, those who criticize her saying, the virgin did not say so many things. To this she answers. This is again her, her writing. Our writings to say that, that is to say that these are ours, are both too much and too little, impossible to say everything. I am greatly ignorant, but if I were a scholar of the most learned, I could not write anything from above, because the expressions of the greatest scholars do not reach the shadow of the truth of the expressions that we use to talk up there. That is, she seems to be saying, the Blessed Mother wasn't speaking to her in French. The Blessed Mother, it's this spiritual communication, which the, something we don't understand, some mystical reality in which it's communicated spiritually, these words. The, intuitive, the, the, language, of, the language from above is a movement of the soul, of the wishes of the soul, of the impulses of the soul, and the lively eyes of the soul understand each other. So Melanie was given this vast transcendent vision, which had a thousand and a thousand times more than the words. And even the words weren't French, weren't English, weren't Latin. And so she has to, in a sense, translate this, these words spoken to her by the Blessed Mother. And so we acknowledge that there is a part of the secret which is truly from Melanie, which is her writing and expressing this. And that is very similar to how the fathers of the church describe the biblical authors writing down sacred scripture. As the church affirms, it's truly man and truly God who are both at work here. And it's also similar, her description of her experience, to what Saint, how St. Saint Thomas Aquinas describes the prophetic experience, where he says it can be an intellectual communication, a communication of words, or a communication of visions. And her experience seems to encompass all three. So I think that's a relatively... Uh, plausible, reasonable explanation for the differences between these two secrets. However, it could still be that Melanie just made it up. Is Melanie a credible person? Is, someone, is she someone who we can believe? And that's what Father Courtville investigates heavily in his thesis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, even people called the Great Missions Fall, like King David. So Father Courtville investigates Melanie's character. You know, was she emotionally unstable? Was she mentally fragile? Was she unbalanced, proud, an egotist, anti-Semitic, a masochist? Was she unduly influenced by French politics? And so on and so forth, as she's been accused of on so many occasions. Because Melanie was such a public person, we have great records from her life, where she was, what she was doing, decisions she made. She was writing to people all the time. People were um, asking her about the apparition for her spiritual advice. So we have tons of uh, written information. 
And we acknowledge, Father Michelle Cordville acknowledges that Melanie was, uh, you know, she had wounds, emotional wounds from her childhood. Um, and she also, a person who grew up on the mountainside, she found the cramped, relative, so to speak, cramped life of the cloister difficult. And also the, the, the kind of weight of the spiritual attacks she was undergoing throughout her life from demonic forces and different things that that, that can be very heavy on a person. But from a historical and psychological review, which he defended before the Angelicum, he feels she checks out in every category as lucid, rational, uh, a person of goodwill who is making, um, who wasn't unbalanced or, or any of these criticisms leveled against her. Not that she was perfect, but, but that she checks out in all these categories. What's furthermore is that we have the testimony of so many credible witnesses, like priests, saints, religious superiors, that Melanie was, in fact, very holy, extremely patient, charitable, kind, um, and all the descriptions you'd find of a classical saint. And so he believes that she actually was a saint and that she's credible. Regarding the animus towards Melanie, that all these attacks on her, it's not surprising that if there is deep corruption somewhere in the church, which that's actually undeniable to say that the, the French bishops just came out with a study recently regarding all the sexual abuse in the French church of the past hundred years, which corresponds to her message. People question the, the kind of numbers they were using in that study, but still there's been an immense amount of abuse. If someone is shining a prophetic light on this dark place in the church, it's not surprising that that prophetic light is met with reprisals. That is the description of the life of Jesus. The light came into the world, but those who were in darkness hated the light, and they put him to death. As Jesus says, I am sending you prophets, some of whom you will kill and crucify, some of whom you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. Then he, gets, he just gets real intense. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the innocent blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all this will come upon this generation. That's an example of that kind of intense prophetic language, that very, very uh, intense. They didn't kill, none of these people he's speaking of killed uh, Zechariah. But he's not, he's not speaking, he says, all this blood will come upon this generation. He doesn't mean the people alive at that time. He means those who are sons of the devil, as he says, the, those who reject God and follow the demon, even if they're a member of the Jewish hierarchy or the Catholic hierarchy. Regarding Mel Melanie's, the, or the criticism of the clergy in the message, Melanie has very humble, beautiful words to say regarding that. But rather than read her words, I'd rather read the, the words of the church itself. When the church was beatifying Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora, a housewife, a battered wife, a mother, who received some strong prophecies against the, the clergy in Rome, you know, way over the top, talking about mass, God massacring clergy or, or God's judgment being, being affected on them. When they were beatifying her and they had to deal with these intense writings, this is what the, the Congregation of Rites said. Complaints of this kind, sometimes expressed in even more vibrant language, these, these complaints from God, are absolutely nothing new in the writings of the servants of God. Certain visions and revelations concerning above all the highest and smallest prelates of Rome, that is bishops of Rome, that are highly charged and include malignant qualifiers appear to shock the faithful. But the words of the servant of God before sounding bad or offensive to pious ears must be considered very useful especially to the priests who read them. So he's saying that these criticisms are very common in prophetic writings, and they are inauthentic ones, and they're useful uh, for priests. And the last point before I conclude, uh, regarding events contained in the secret. When I read the secret, especially the secret from 78, it's wild. And there's a lot of, it's talking about all this stuff, and it seems to me like a lot of this hasn't happened. And... There's, there's three explanations for that, in my opinion. One 
is that they happened and I'm just ignorant of history and that's very much could be the case regarding certain events. A second is that they've been fulfilled in a spiritual way, a way that I have a very human understanding of this and there's a, a deeper meaning. But a third thing which Melanie says is the case with this message is that they are contingent. That is, God can change his plans, so to speak. A contingent prophecy, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, means that God gives a message. He gives a, reveals a future that is to come. But it's not a fatalistic future. It doesn't mean that definitively this is going to happen. He's revealing something that will happen if man does not change or if, in case events do not change, even though he doesn't say it. And so the iconic uh, image of this, which you all know, is Jonah and Nineveh, God's message is 40 days more and Nineveh will be destroyed. A positive, definitive statement. He doesn't say, but if you repent, I'll change my mind. Um, but the people repent and Nineveh is not destroyed. Melanie herself, when she, she says this, when she's asked about this, this second secret, this second secret which no one has ever seen, a priest asks her about it. He says, why why haven't we seen this? She writes, because it contains such secrets of divine mercy that by learning them, men, men instead of praying to ward off events, so these events can be warded off by prayer, would be in a hurry to see them happen in order to enjoy more quickly the unprecedented triumph of the church. So that's very hopeful. The message of La Salette is very scary. It's very uh, harsh. It's very intense. And it, it's, not, it's not positive. Not much that's positive in it. What's hopeful is that she says that message is meant to cause people to repent, to, to lead people to repent. And that beyond that, our Lord has such secrets of divine mercy that we'd be willing, we'd be happy for those events to happen in order to see this unprecedented triumph of the church, which she says will take place afterwards. So to conclude, Melanie and Maximin remain controversial figures in the history of the church, in, in church culture. Uh, however, the, the beatification of Giacomo Cusmano, the canonization of St. Anibal di Francia, in the raising to the altar of servant of God, Nazarena Mahon, all these people who drew great inspiration from Melanie at the point when people were criticizing her the most is a, is a real improvement in their situation. And secondly, the, this landmark study by Father Michel Courtville approved by the Angelicum is another great step in the hopeful eventual vindication of these two children. Uh, the church has no ban on praying for their intercession there's actually an official approved prayer for their intercession. And as in the case of St. Joan of Arc, especially in these controversial cases, it can often take a very long time uh, for, for their vindication. Um, I pray that you know, one day they may be raised to the altar, and I think especially for those children who, so many children who suffer, they can be very good intercessors. So we can just conclude with a moment of prayer. I encourage you to just close your eyes and take a moment in quiet. And in, in silence, if you want, you could confide any intention you have to, to Our Lady of La Salette under that appellation, or if you'd like to, to Melanie or Maximin. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I don't know if there are any...